Welcome to Ella's Beef Easter's Radio Air Check and Classic TV Channel. Ella says nothing short of total amnesty would be required for their return home. They called any alternate service as a condition of their return ludicrous. Ohio Republican Senator Robert Taft Jr. says that he would allow all draft dodgers to return home if they agree to work for three years in various federal agencies. Communist China says the United States, in its words, is hatching a new plot to get Thailand to send troops into Cambodia. The Chinese People's Daily charges tonight that the Thai troops would be used to counter communist gains in Cambodia. The article warned that Thai leaders would come to a no-good end if they pursue such a policy. A full-scale investigation has been launched into the stabbing death tonight of an inmate at the Norfolk State Prison. The victim is identified as 36-year-old Theodore Maver of Peabody. Maver was serving a life sentence for second-degree murder. Four inmates were carrying Maver out of the prison dining area after dinner tonight when a corrections officer spotted the group. Maver was rushed to the prison hospital where he was pronounced dead of a puncture wound in the chest. A spokesman for Norfolk Prison Superintendent Theodore Rostano says the superintendent is ready to spend the whole night interrogating inmates who were in Maver's cell block tonight. The largest single group of Soviet Jews to emigrate to Israel arrived in Tel Aviv tonight. Disembarking from an LL 747 jetliner, the 350 Russian Jews shouted shalom as they had a tearful reunion with waiting relatives. Most of the immigrants, among them doctors, engineers, and taxi drivers, will settle in the northern Negev desert area where Israel has built new communities on the rocky sands. Boston's weather today, it'll be mostly clear for the rest of tonight. Low temperatures will be in the 20s for Tuesday. For today, mostly sunny and warmer. High temperatures will be in the 40s with southwesterly winds 15 to 25 miles per hour. And for tonight, fair low temperatures in the upper 20s inland to the mid-30s along the coast. For Wednesday, increasing cloudiness and continued mild with high temperatures around 50. Currently in Boston, it's 25 degrees. Repeating the top story at this hour, Senator Edward Kennedy blasted President Nixon's civil rights policies tonight. Senator Kennedy was making one of the most important speeches in many months, and that speech came just three days before President Nixon's State of the Union address. And that's the 12 o'clock WBZ report with portions recorded. I'm Harry Sabas, WBZ News, reminding you that taxes are a fact of life, but one consolation is that state and local income and most sales taxes are deductible on your federal return. Check your tax instructions. Now, once again, back to the Jerry Williams Show. Two five four five six seven eight. Hello, America. Welcome back. This is Jerry Williams. We're discussing uh, Dick Levitan and Paul Jeffers' book, See Paris and Die, Brutality in the U.S. Marines, with the former uh, Captain Bill Cusack, who, by the way, is a Westinghouse employee. He's a sales manager here at WBZ. Jim Finnegan of the Manchester Union Leader, John J. McDuffie, the Bureau Chief of Foster's Daily Democrat in Dover, Dick Levitan, H. Paul Jeffers of the book, and I'm Jerry Williams. We'll get to the calls and comments at 254-5678. Hello. Austin, WBZ. His name, sir. Okay, fine. Please don't mention your name. We're happy to have you aboard, but no names, if you will. Okay, thank you. Okay? Right. right. Okay, well, I served in the Marine Corps for three years between 1967 and 1970. I spent uh, approximately eight weeks at Paris Island, and uh, I'm not really sh clear on uh, the uh, object of the author's book, uh, but I I'd like to uh, give my impressions of, of uh, what, I, what I went through in boot camp. Uh, most recruits realize that the treatment given to them in boot camp is inhumane, dehumanizing, and brutal but they won't say anything for numerous reasons, some of which are uh, fear of worse brutality from the drill instructors, fear of going to a motivation platoon, which is, uh, was referred to earlier as CPP, or being set back for a week of training, uh, and this has happened numerous times to, to a lot of guys, uh, where they'll be, be set back in training for weeks on, on top of weeks, just because they don't, uh, appear to go along with the program and and uh, through the process of being beaten and things they'll rebel uh, or did, may also I ask being sent to the brig. Did, did you go to the motivation platoon? Uh, no, I never did. I went through, I kept my mouth shut 
because at this time, I, uh, at the time I went through boot camp, I felt I was, I was going to get worse treatment in Vietnam, which I ended up going to, and which I, I didn't, I, I, I did receive worse treatment in Vietnam, but uh, the, the whole thing was, I, 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 I felt that uh, I, I, was, I was going for a cause that is uh, completely uh, not true anymore, uh, and, and I realize this now. I wish I had realized it when I was in boot camp. Uh, were you ever uh, were you ever assaulted? I mean, physically by a drill instructor, beaten up? I I was choked. I was choked by the. Why were you choked? What what uh, prompted for, that? For uh, I I can't remember the instance, but it was it was nothing uh, that I I felt was uh, wrong. Uh, I I was I was a. a Actually, a, a sample marine in boot camp. I was good. Would you talk I, I about that? I made TFC out of boot camp, but some of this harassing in boot camp uh, was given to, to because they knew that I would take it and I would not say anything. You were choked. Anything else? Uh, well, a lot of other things else. Yeah. For instance, give us some examples. Uh, having to to hold a, a a rifle straight out for uh, long periods of time. How long? Uh, Oh, minutes. I mean, just one minute is lo too long with an M14 rifle. Okay, what else happened to you? Uh, oh, geez. I, 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 could, I could spend all night. It was eight weeks I was there. Do uh, you consider that holding the rifle out brutality? Uh, no, I don't consider that. I consider choking, which I referred yeah, to earlier yeah, would you, as would, brutality. Wait, 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 finish. Would you just elucidate a little bit on what choking, you know, what that meant exactly? I mean uh, choking until I couldn't... Uh, so my my uh, learning, I wasn't killed. I mean, that's obviously. obvious, but it was very close. And and these drill instructors go to a DI school where they are taught different methods of brutality. Now I never went to DI school, but I have talked with DIs. I met one in Vietnam, and we had a good beer session in 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 the club. And and he told me some of the things. And out of out of in boot camp, there are three DIs, uh, one of which is specialized in. Uh, brutal actions uh, in other words to inflict fear into the into the recruit uh, so that he, he will he will obey the orders better uh, bec knowing that uh, well they'll, they'll say that okay if you don't obey this order we're gonna get sergeant so-and-so on you and automatically you, you'll, you'll obey because out of, <clears throat> out of the seven out of the 70 or so guys that were in your platoon yes uh, how many of them would you say uh, got treatment like that uh, out of the 70, I would say all 70. At one time or other, they were given some kind of brutal treatment that was against regulations. But we didn't know the regulations because we weren't informed. The of drill them. instructors know the regulations, though, right? Yes, of course. And what they tell you is, we have to do this to you so you'll learn how to obey orders, right? Right. But they themselves are consciously and knowingly dis disobeying regimental orders. Every day. Uh, Finnegan? Yes, could we comment on this? Uh, First of all, uh, and this is not to discount what the gentleman said, quite obviously, we're not in a position to uh, document what he said. We don't have any names, dates, etc. Uh, what how we had, we, what we we had of course, is... We can't do that I know everybody. That. I said, we'll so we're not the, in a position we'll to take document anything. Do you word, think this fellow called just excuse up me, We'll take everybody's said, word, pro or con. You want to, all right, before you... Know, you all right, I right? just said... Either way. I think you must have some familiarity, Mr. Williams, with the English language. I just began that statement by saying, I do not discount... What this you gentleman said. Do you understand though. that? Yes, you plant the seed but that there's see, something wrong with what, what he says. Not at all. What I am saying, if you'll let me complete this statement, is that sitting here this evening in the studio, we're not in a position to investigate that. We were in a position to investigate in the alleged incident. The alleged alleged incidents raised in this book. And it's Mr. Finnegan, are you not shocked by the callers? Talk to this caller. Mr. Finnegan, are you not shocked by the woman in the caller? Can I talk to the caller? Okay. Fine. The caller is the person we're talking to now. I mean, if you want to go on to the book, we'll do another five hours. The point I'm trying to make to the caller, that this book is not simply concerned with pushing and shoving. The title of this book is See Paris and Die. And the authors have distorted this book throughout. 
They have taken a couple of cases of Don't you of want a to ask this caller Nelson. anything about his experience? I do indeed, but can I just finish, please? Sure, but I, I you're not dealing the with case the case of Private Mr. Nelson, the case of Private Concepcion, the case of Private Bartolomeo. What and they about tried the case to of reason this man back on the telephone? And Mr. they tried to claim this. Because we are talking about deaths here. The book is titled See Paris and Die. We're taking calls now. And Mr. right Finnegan, now, we want and, you also give this, and you also give the complete title, my friend. Mr. Finnegan, give the complete title of this book. See Paris and Die. Brutality in the U.S. Marines. Yeah, this well, man is so, a victim of it. Talk yeah, to him. I, Let him tell you what's going on. I, Never mind I, what the Marine Corps has told you. To this no, wait a minute. I, we listened quietly to a bunch right. of callers who called saying that they felt it was fine. Now here's a, a, somebody on the other side of the question. Why don't you cross-examine him? I'd like I'm to have some... All right, now, would you let me finish this? I am no, trying to, to say caller. to this caller that I have no doubt that there are cases of brutality in the United States Marine Corps at Paris Island. I don't for a minute condone that. Neither does Mr. Cusick. Nobody's saying that Neither you do. does Mr. Con uh, Mr. McDuffie, see. And in any instance where a case of that type of thing is brought to our attention, we'll certainly do something about it. But that is not the point, really, of the discussion this evening. Well, how can we deal These with the caller? These gentlemen have over this and tried to draw a certain Mr. case Finnegan. involving three young men who died, but not Mr. who Finnegan, were simply pushed This gentleman pushed on the telephone doesn't know anything about that. He's listening to the conversation. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he's an intelligent no. gentleman. He's Nobody been wants listening to give you his own experience. I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm uh, sure this gentleman knows the distinction between being pushed and being murdered. He said choked. Choked uh, or could, murdered. Could I, could I uh, add a little criticism to, to the book, maybe? Uh... You'd probably like this. Uh, I, I'm sorry that that book only uh, referred to a few cases, because there, there are numerous cases of uh, deaths within uh, Paris Island and also San Diego. Uh, Paris Island especially because of, I mean, you're entrapped there. You're surrounded by water. Numerous times you'll find drownings. The day I graduated boot camp, uh, two people were found drowned outside the... Uh, uh, behind the barracks that I had just graduated from. These guys had just reported that day, they got scared, and they, they, uh, they, ran, they ran off, uh, and n not aware of what was outside them. I mean, there's no security that prevented them from going into that, into that swamp. Uh, th there's also numerous times that guys have just died from, from over-exercise, which should have been evaluated before they were inducted uh, which wasn't probably a lot of a lot of cases come out that they weren't fit for military service and they've died. Uh, I mean, there's there's just so many cases that you can refer to uh, on on the part of brutality <laughs> in the Marine Corps. We, we detail several. Mr. Of Mr. McDuffie, let Mr. Mr. McDuffie respond. All right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to come back to the point, into the title. We were just on the point. This man has been may talking I, about talk what this Mr. book Jeffers? is about. May, now, may let, I, let us respond please, to the caller. That, that's the person I'm trying to pinpoint. He is, the caller. He is I'm attempting to. Yes. All right, to the caller. Uh, and back to the... Uh, I don't know how you can do that, go reading ahead. from a piece okay, of Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, uh, go ahead, Mr. Jeffers. No, when no, through, uh, I'll begin uh, Paul, again. will you step aside? Let Mr. McDuffie respond to the caller, all right? Okay, I'm here. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, the point that I'm attempting to make to you, sir, if I have the opportunity is that the name of this book is See Paris and Die, Brutality, Brutality in the United States Marine Corps. And the point that I would make here at this point is that these two gentlemen have failed, and I repeat, have failed, to present any documentation whatsoever to support their allegations that there have been deaths attributable directly to brutality at Paris Island. Now, on November 18th, 1971... Okay, we're not responding to the caller again. He had something to say, and we right. like, what we'd like to do is respond to what he had to say. You say. I, I thought it was Williams, responsive. if you'll let him finish, I, I'm sure he's going to respond Well, that's a written completely. response to something no, that this caller didn't have anything to say about. No, it, it isn't a written response. It isn't. Uh, it's my notes uh, on an interview that we conducted on November 18th, 1971, with Captain D.E. Brown. Now, that would be the United States Navy, and not the Marine Corps. And Captain Brown happens to be the head of neuropsychiatry division of the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery in Washington, D.C. And from 1959 to August 1964, he was the director of the neuropsychiatric section at Paris Island. Now, Captain Brown has informed us that it simply is not true that maltreatment of recruits is subtly condoned at Paris Island. 
Concerning the psychiatric screening of drill instructors, Captain Brown said that the DI recruits are Marines who already have had an outstanding military record in the first place, and that they must be dedicated because a DI is in a very vulnerable position by virtue of being the uh, leader of the platoon. So every attempt is made to screen out those with problems, marital difficulties, those who exhibit any lack of self-control. Uh, I think that that is uh, is. Does that respond quite, to this call? That somehow, I don't see the response. Fine. As far as the this, uh, this the, the fellow's drill instructors, three drill instructors, somehow got through that that screening process. Th that sounds fine on paper, but I I don't see it being enacted in the platoons in boot camp. I I don't see that happening. Well, uh, yes. Or didn't happen uh, during my short term there, and I know a lot of other well, uh, I, Marines that will vouch for that. Yes. I, and I, I know a lot of them that will just keep quiet also. I think uh, that, uh, let's come back to the choking incident, yes. if we may. <laughs> Excuse me, in 1943, I was choked. And I will give you the circumstances under which I was choked. All right. It was in the barracks, and there were some 60 men in the platoon. The senior drill instructor was giving a lecture on a blackboard. It was a simulated combat situation whereby with the placement of hundreds of X's upon the blackboard he created an enemy position completely encircling a small unit of some 13 Marines but he left about a quarter of an inch on the bottom of that large encirclement and pointed to me and asked me to come up there and tell him what I would do were I in command of that particular platoon. And I looked at uh, those hundreds of crosses, and I took the uh, pointer, and I aimed it at that little quarter-inch opening on the bottom, and I said, Sir, I would retreat right down through here. At which point, he grabbed me by the uh, front of my dungaree jacket, lifted me, and I happened to be six foot one, but I was dangling on the end of my toes. I would say that I was being choked. And he said to me, Macduffie, you've uttered that word one time in the Marine Corps. Never let me hear you say it again. And what that sergeant did at that time was give an object lesson to 59 other young recruits in that platoon. And I know that I haven't, and I doubt very much if they have ever again uttered the word retreat. Brutality? I didn't think so at the time. Now, do I think so now? Well, uh, uh, they better tell President Nixon about his retreat from Vietnam, then, because that word has been uttered over and over again. And it, 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 Not it by McDuffie, in, Mr. Williams. No, it evidently imputes that the Marines never have retreated in any, in any way. Oh, whatsoever. yes, they came down through the Choicing Reservoir in uh, Korea, and I think the message went out from the commanding well, officer that I'm we are is that attacking the, in a different direction. All I'm saying is that... Uh, to my, unit was, my unit was withdrawn from uh, Vietnam... Uh, I call it a retreat because it was the 27th Marines and we had lost so many men that we were pulled out of Vietnam in 1968, uh, 69, I'm sorry, 1969. Uh, we were we we retreated. Uh, only it wasn't it wasn't. Well, uh, I really don't think that's the because, point. I think the point the point is uh, that uh, the, your your comments are accepted, probably not accepted by Mr. Finnegan and Mr. McDuffie, oh, as being uh, as being factual. But uh, there they are. No, they are. Accepted. They are. They are. They are, they are accepted. Don't misrepresent what we said. Well, I'm asking. That's no. a, the <coughs> we it's a kind of a question. Uh, to, uh, to no, our whole right? point, Mr. Williams, was about alleging that young men are go, go down there and are killed. They come out every day in a pine box, mm -hmm. as well, Mr. Levitan says, this every day in a well, pine box. This gentleman box. said he saw two guys drown. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, but, could uh, I ask but, and, uh, Is that killed? They're afraid to say, uh, are, they, are they killed? Yes, they drowned, murdered uh, by someone. Uh, the gentleman yeah. who just called. I, murdered by someone. I don't know the answer to that, well, right? Jerry, could right. I ask Hello? the caller? Hello, yeah. just a second. Uh, were they killed, sir? Yes, they, they did die. I murdered in your eyes? Uh, pardon? In your eyes, would the term murder be proper? Uh... On, on, no, I, I, I don't believe I can say that in this instance, mm -hmm. All right. because That's they, the well, well, just out of the fear, they ran into sure. the... A uh, couple of guys die in Marine Corps, nobody cares, they just drown, and that's the end of nobody it. Nobody right. said that. See you later. Tough, you didn't that that make it, 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 fellas. It, it nobody said that. Well, that that's unfair, my friend. That's an unfair snide remark, as you know, Mr. Williams. We have as much feeling for the victims of brutality as any gentleman on the other side of this table. Well, then why don't you listen to what this We just happen to be particularly angry at the shabby tactics of trying to tie this in a causal relationship 
of deaths. This well, book let, is let, called See what, Paris we, and we, Die, and I you can give got, the subtitle all night if you want. You've said that four times. People hear you, Jim, the first time around. Well, you seem to have difficulty understanding <laughs> I don't well have any difficulty office. at all. Well, then why don't we get into one of these specific cases so we can discuss We have one on the telephone, sir. We have one on the telephone. All right. Jerry, could I have Don't you wait a minute. Don't you want to talk to the callers, Jim? Oh, indeed I do. Well, that's what we want to do. That's why we went this extra hour. Isn't this gentleman off the air? No. No, he's Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I thought you were All of these callers, I'm going from one call to the other so we can get at least some relationship to the public here. Okay, I thought the gentleman had... No, he's still there. Well, a final question to this fellow. There are other people waiting. Right. Do you feel the brutal treatment that you underwent in recruit training is what saved your life in Vietnam, or would you have been able to survive as a good Marine without it extending that far? Uh, yes, I, I believe that I, I could have survived without uh, the brutal training in, in uh, Paris Island boot camp, because it, it had no relevancy to, towards the Vietnam War. Now, maybe it did in the World, World War II or Korea, but it just has no relevancy in Vietnam, and especially so today, it was whereas not designed the war is so dehumanized, <laughs> you're just sitting in a bunker pushing buttons fighting a war. There's no more ground troops over there. I don't see why this, this procedure has to exist any longer, because this, this whole war has taken away from the ground troops. All right, well, let's not get into the war. Thank you very much, sir. It's 1223 on WBZ. <laughs> let's continue at 2545678. Hello. Hello, Jerry. Yes, sir? Yeah, I... Uh, I didn't catch the last part. Uh, who's the Marine officer that's here now? Because I'm a traveling salesman, and I just came in. You know, I heard you <laughs> well, if, if you missed the last, <laughs> if you missed the last four hours, it would really be unfair. No, 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 I, no, no I, the, I, the, the, who, Captain McDuffie, is that what it was? No, no, no. Mr. That's McDuffie corporal. was an, uh, was a Marine in World War II. Bill Cusack is the former Marine captain who was out in 1967 or 8. Seven. Okay, Seven. Fine. The, que the question that I had to ask is, you see, I, I caught about a good hour and a half because I was coming back from up north. And the question I had to ask is that, I'll tell you a little background. When I went to the Marine Corps, they showed us me never hit Paris Island, number one. Whoopee. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, we want to get to it. You see, we got okay, a lot of callers and, and want to get to a lot of comments. As far as the gentleman who was saying it, as far as... Brutality. Maybe we'll get a call tonight from the tallest Marine recruit. You know, <laughs> well, what is yeah, that going to yeah. tell us? Well, the, the, the point that I'm getting at is this. Is they, they were talking about... Uh, see Paris Island and dying and things of this nature as far as brutality goes. Mm -hmm. Gee, I spent, you know, as many weeks as anybody else could spend there, and I couldn't see whether there was any brutality whatsoever. What, what do they call brutality? Gentlemen, what do you call brutality in the uh, Marine recruit? Well, <clears throat> Uh, I went over it earlier. I will again, and I'll use the Marine. Well, uh, don't don't the Marine Corps. Corps well, just, just be specific and, and just say, you know, a particular incident, anything, you know. Other well, than under you're under that Marine die there, you know, under I Marine Corps, Corps put up quite a few men over the last okay, few years. Okay, let me answer. Let me answer. Under Marine Corps regulations, any time a drill instructor lays a hand on someone except to correct his posture or adjust his uniform, is regarded as an act of maltreatment. That's punching, kicking, slapping, making you hold a rifle out, making you do push-ups uh, for longer than the regulations require. It goes on and on and on. Six pages in a regimental training uh, bulletin outlines the things that should not be done. That's what I'm talking about. And you, and you actually, in all this, that you would consider if a man held a rifle out in front of him for a few minutes, whatever happens to be... It's not what I consider, consider it, sir. Sir, it's not what I consider it. It's what the United States Marine Corps does. We started with the Marine Corps definition of what maltreatment is. Right. And that is listed under maltreatment. And it's a court martial bill offense. Okay. Now, with um, uh, this Captain uh, Cusick, he's an ex-captain. I guess you know, what do you say, 67 or 68? 67. Seven. Seven. Sorry. All right. May I talk to you for a second, please? Surely. Captain. Yep. Yes, I have a question for you. Okay. Do, you do you figure that the men that are going through Paris Island now are going past what I went through 12 years ago? Do you think that they suffered any kind of brutality, such as what these men are talking about? Would you consider that brutality yourself, personally, as an ex-Marine? No, I don't. No, well, no I don't consider it brutality. Honestly, it, it could right? be, according to the definition or the Marine Corps regulation, but personally, um, uh, I was made to do... Uh, quite a few push-ups on several occasions. I was made uh, to hold a rifle at length for quite a period of time. Uh, I, in my mind, that's part of becoming a Marine rather that's than right. brutality. That's right. If you can't cut it there, you're not going to cut it later on. I would like to clarify uh, a point. Not, not knowing at the time, he just revealed when he was there in 1960 at uh, Paris Island, apparently, that a period after the 1956 death march... Uh, that's right. And led I by have an uncle that was there at the time that it happened. Right, led by uh, Sergeant Matthew McCune of uh, right. West Boylston, Massachusetts. Right. Uh, several recruits drowned, 
and it was a celebrated case. And between that time and the 60s, almost up to the time of the Vietnam War, uh, that the maltreatment and brutality uh, was curtailed to a great degree. However, according to our findings, that it increased greatly when the pipeline to Vietnam was required to be stepped up. In other words, send the men in uh, more rapidly. They needed them for actual combat training, and that's uh, at the point that we say that there was an increase of the brutality. Could yeah, I comment on that, please? You see, the basis of that, and what I think you're probably, you know, you're neglecting is, even if they enforce anything other than what they did, like in the 1960s, or like when Captain Cusick was in, he doesn't consider it brutality. It's just that they, if they break there, they're going to break later on. All right, uh, Bill, uh, Jim Finnegan? Well, I, I think that for once this evening, I can agree with Mr. Levitan about uh, cases of brutality increasing in proportion to the moment of national stress. Now, I, I think this, in fact, is understandable to a degree. You see, we're dealing with human beings here. We're not dealing with automatons. Oh, no, the drill instructor is also a human being, and, and these people have an obligation. They're trying to save these young men lives. They're trying to instill in them discipline and immediate obeying to, uh, obedience to an order. They want to put them in that position because if they don't obey, they in, it jeopardize not only their own life in a combat zone, but also the men in that platoon and everyone That's right, else. Fellow, and because of that, there's no question, there's no question that there should be. Uh, it, it's not defensible in the sense that anybody approves of brutality, but it's defensible in the sense that we all understand human nature, that a DI put under this kind of pressure, concern for that young man, his safety after he leaves Paris Island, may on occasion overreact. No question about it. All right, and we're going to break here for a moment uh, and return to your calls and comments at 2545678. We're in the midst of the Larry Glick Show, and we're taking an hour of Larry's time. He'll be here at 105 in the morning to talk to former Marine Captain Bill Cusack, Jim Finnegan, John J. McDuffie, Dick Levitan, and Paul Jeffers. Are your children or other members of your family prepared to meet an unexpected financial burden? Well, many people in the upper age brackets suddenly discover that their life insurance coverage is not enough to avoid burdening their families. Perhaps they've even put off this important issue completely. That's why more and more people in the 46 to 87 age bracket have turned to the unique offer being made to New England residents by Life of America Insurance Corporation of Boston. Life of America is offering no refusal life insurance, permanent life insurance, regardless of past medical history with no exam required. And coverage starts as low as $6.95 a month. No salesman will call to pressure you. You're under no obligation whatsoever. Simply call 423-3360 now. Or write to Life Insurance, WBZ Radio, Boston 02134. Include your birth date. Life of America is filling the need of those aged 46 to 87. You have nothing to lose by investigation. Again, the number is 423 423- 3360 or write to Life Insurance WBZ Radio Boston 02134. WBZ The Spirit of 103 Boston The Spirit of New England WBZ Boston Group W Westinghouse Broadcasting it's 1230. Crimson Travel is making 1972 a super year, and to start things off right, Crimson has arranged some fantastic one-week super specials to Europe. A week in London, Paris, or a week of skiing in Switzerland from as low as $263 per person double occupancy. That's only $263 for a whole week in London, including BOAC jet hotel transportation between the airport and the hotel, full English breakfast daily, sightseeing, theater tickets, and lots more. A super special for January, February, and March only from only $263. Or if you prefer Paris, it's only $273. Skiing in Switzerland, only $278. No clubs to join. Crimson Travel has arranged everything. And you go as individuals on these super special packages. But remember, you've got to act fast. The airlines have limited the rates, the lowest ever offered, to January, February, and March only. Call Crimson Travel at 868-2600 for one week. Super specials to Europe, 868-2600. Now returning to the calls and comments, hello. Good evening, Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to make a few interjections right now. All right. Um, first of all, concerning one of uh, Mr. Finnegan's earlier snide remarks to the two authors, um, it dealing with the fact that they split into Paris Island on the coattails of um, a congressman. Yes, right. Congressman Diaggi, yes. 
Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Finnegan, I understand he went to Paris Island with um, Mr. McDuffie yes. and another gentleman? Correct. Mr. Rosenthal. Right. Um, did Mr. Rosenthal uh, ever have anything to do with the Marines? And yes. if he did, I'd like to ask Mr. Finnegan if um, he thinks that uh, his affiliation with the Marines helped him in uh, gathering uh, the information he did. Yes, Mr. Rosenthal's uh, uh, familiarity with the Marine Corps, he's a 22-year veteran, now retired. He was the United States Marine Corps recruiter in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal's uh, familiar familiarity with the Marine Corps channels, uh, command, etc., was uh, invaluable to us. Uh, incidentally, and I, I don't know if this is what you're asking, uh, we certainly weren't spoon-fed any information. As a matter of fact, we had a very, very difficult time getting information. You see, uh, the Marine Corps uh, officials at uh, you Paris said that Island, a particularly. Of times. What, what did you Can have I finish? Getting? No, I'm asking. Just tell me what I'm difficulty asking. you had getting. Uh, all of these personnel reports on all of these people, all all of these cases, the Concepcion case, the Bartolomeo case, the Nelson case, the cases that you raise in the book, alleged uh, brutality caused their death, and then back away from this evening. You see, that is what uh, we, we had difficulty. We have backed away one bit. Well, I'm afraid you have, sir. Because I'm sorry, we. Sorry, sir. Well, I you have not. Well, <laughs> let's not lose the caller. All, all right. right. Go uh, ahead, sir. The point I wanted to make was that um, I, I, see, I see nothing wrong with these two gentlemen uh, having the aid of a congressman. If you have the um, aid of a ex-Marine, uh, an important veteran, um, I think he probably helped you as much as uh, the congressman helped these two. They, they said earlier that uh, they had quite a bit of trouble in, uh, in gaining their information. Right. Uh, could I respond to that? See, we're not, we're not objecting uh, simply to the fact that they had the assistance of a congressman. What we're objecting to the fact is that the authors raised the point uh, that they, their, first of all, their vehicle was preceded by a Provo Marshal vehicle with the lights flashing, that they were given the red carpet treatment, you see, by General Petros and this type of thing, and also some completely unfair accusations about uh, that they were told by uh, uh, Congressman Biagi's uh, staff assistant, uh, Mr. Frasca, uh, about reports of the uh, Marine Corps providing girls for visiting dignitaries and that type of thing. But you see, they were, this was untrue. But you see, they objected to Pardon this. Me? Uh, they objected to this, you see, the, the fact that according to protocol, the Marine Corps would provide a visiting congressman with certain accommodations. He wouldn't provide, uh, for example, Mr. McDuffie or Mr. Rosenthal uh, uh, and myself. And they object to that, see? But it, m my point was, if they object to that, then don't go in there on the coattails of a congressman. Go in there on your own. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that the um, flashing light car probably made up for the inconvenience they were put through. I'd like to make another uh, interjection right now. Surely. Um, Mr. Williams? Yeah. Earlier you got into a um, conversation with Mr. Finnegan about um, truth and fair journalism. Mm -hmm. And right now I'd like to... Just in closing, I'd like to quote one of our late presidents, who on the eve of his election in 1960, President Ken Kennedy, I'd like to quote a statement he made in his speech, and I quote right now, I would like to have the union leader print a headline that we carried New Hampshire. I believe there is probably a more irresponsible newspaper in the United States, but I can't think of it. I believe that there is a publisher who has less regard for the truth than William Loeb, but I can't think of his name. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Any yes. comment to that? Sure, I'd like to comment. As a matter of fact, we did headline that charge by uh, the late President Kennedy on the Union leader, and I think you should also understand what happened there. Uh, President Kennedy, and, and we don't hold any uh, ill will toward him, this was in the middle of a political campaign, and you sometimes take your points when you gave them. Uh, the late uh, Senator Stiles Bridges was also alive at the time. He was the uh, senior senator from the state of New Hampshire. Uh, uh, Mr. Kennedy came into the uh, city of New Hampshire, which has had a, a very uh, sorry history of anti-Catholicism. An attempt was made there, for example, uh, to burn down a Catholic church at one time. Fortunately, it was headed off. It was, this was part of the old know-nothing movement. And uh, Mr. Kennedy used the phrase know-nothingism, and, and we accused him of knowing full well what that phrase meant in that community. And we hit him hard editorially, as I feel we were justified in doing. He came back with his rebuttal, and his rhetoric was, call uh, his rhetoric was called for. We have no objection to that. May I make a comment, Jerry, since we're on this point? And the caller brought it up. <clears throat> uh, my background is journalism. I taught journalism at uh, Boston University for four years. I teach it now at City College of New York. I was a Fulbright lecturer in journalism 
in Thailand. Journalism has been my whole life. I'm proud to be a journalist. I know a little bit about American journalism. And I know a little bit about the Manchester Union Leader, which is why I'm here. Frankly, it was a little inconvenient to come up here tonight. But being on a radio program with, with a gentleman from the Manchester Union Leader, frankly, was too good an opportunity to pass up. I didn't always agree with John Kennedy. I'm a Republican. I voted for Richard Nixon in 1960 when I lived in Boston. I was the one vote. I voted for, for Nixon last time, and I'll vote for him again. But I didn't always just, uh, agree with John Kennedy, but I do agree with that statement quoted by this caller. Mayor. If there is, let me finish, if there Mayor. is a more irresponsible newspaper in America than the Manchester Union leader, I don't know what it is. Much is said, Mr. Loeb has mounts all kinds of publicity campaigns in his own behalf, self-serving statements, the much vaunted profit sharing, for instance, that his employers, employees allegedly take part of in, but have never gotten, because Mr. That is another Mr. complete Loeb, misrepresentation. Just a moment, just a Here we finish. go. Mr. Loeb. Here we go. Mr. Loeb, uh, the reply to this that is that he's paying off a loan. He is indeed. The loan was made by um, Mr. Hoffa. Yeah. No, no, no. C before we well, get into this, at any rate, well, any rate. this is a misrepresentation. You'll, you'll be able to answer, <laughs> we're, we're talking, we're talking to to the last point raised, and it, it's off. It, it's perhaps off the subject of the Marine Corps, but not really, because what Mr. Loeb has tried to do is discredit me through his spokesman here as a journalist. I think I'm a good journalist. I think this is a piece of honest reporting. I don't say that there aren't some mistakes in this book. There are. If I could do this book again, those mistakes wouldn't be there. <laughs> They're not as, as many as, as this man from the Manchester Union leader would have you believe. But I think I'm a better journalist than, than Bill Loeb will ever be. And uh, I think his newspaper is a disgrace. Or if you're finished your one-man encomium of your, your own ability, sir, let me call you to task for this. You first of all said there, that, that concerning profit sharing, that no one got it. I want you to understand, first of all, this is a typical example, you see, Mr. Jeffers. You just stepped into it right here. You simply don't bother to get your facts before you issue your misstatements, and you didn't do it in the book. Mr. Loeb happens to be the former national president of the National Council of Profit-Sharing Industries. He has distributed to his employees over one million dollars in profits. Now, if there was, as a matter of fact, Mr. Loeb would be distributing large amounts directly to his employees. We do have a profit-sharing trust at the present time, by the way, but he would be giving cash amounts if he were not paying off that loan, which you mentioned just a while ago, which incidentally was a very legitimate loan, and all payments are up to date. That's and the, now Hoff, that's now the you, Hoffa loan you refer about. That, no, it's not the Hoffa loan. It's from a, a it's pension a trust of the, of the Teamsters Union. It's a perfectly legitimate it's a Teamsters loan. Teamsters Union loan, though. Now, why don't you go into the uh, factual matter as to why he had to go there to try to get that? The fact that sources of loans were dried up to him by some of our political opposition. Why not go into all of this if you're going to raise the lid on this, my friend? Or haven't you bothered to research that either? Now, we had the combined opposition from everyone, from the John Birch Society head, Mr. Robert Welsh, right here, who was lined up with people who were opposing the union leader, uh, as you undoubtedly know, or would know if you had done any research on this, all the way to people out on the left side of the spectrum. And you, why, you want to know why it was, my friend? It had nothing to do, nothing to do with the political views of the newspaper. It had everything to do with the union leader's policy on labor relations. These people, these so-called very, very liberal people, are liberal with the taxpayers' money. They're not liberal with their own. Mr. Loeb pays his employees a, a, a very good salary, as you well know. It's the highest salary paid in any newspaper north of Boston in, in all of New England. Now, you, for you to come up with a stunt like this is absolutely ridiculous. Now, you did concede that there were some stakes in, in your book, and you say not as many as we say. And I went into great detail, did I not, to say how many there were. Forty-six. And how many you had many of you? Well, the reason we alleged and couldn't document it is not once this evening did we get an opportunity to tick these off. I would have liked to tick one off and then allow you to answer each that's one. A, that's a pure, that's unadulterated lie. Well, let's Mr. want to do it right now. Well, we went through that whole conceptual thing. I gave Bartolomeo, you, Mr. McDuffie. Did we give you a chance in one case? That was one but case. We've been We're here four about hours and forty minutes, Mr. Finnegan. We have five pounds more of documents. I understand that, but we can't go on forever. Well, could we try one? 
But we've been through that. Could we the, try one right now? This is the portion of the program I, ne- uh, I always allot to callers. All right, let's 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 go with the caller. Maybe a caller will be interested in hearing Why don't you listen to case. the callers and listen to what they have to say and perhaps respond to them? I am. You, I thought you were going to allow program. me to reply to the charge that this gentleman they just, just made. A completely irresponsible charge about the publisher of the union leader. Go do that. And he knows it. I did. I finished. Why don't you Are you satisfied with the res- with Indeed the... I do. Okay. And we're fully prepared to go on for any number of hours that you want to go on. Right, if we, we want to get into the we can do that. I mean, we were. This is our fifth hour. I mean, this is not a marathon. Well, we brought our pup tents. We'll stay all night. If we well, can get we our can't documentation. Do that. I mean, <laughs> f- five hours is sufficient, don't you think so? Well, if you gentlemen are going to appear anywhere else, you see, we don't have the finances, frankly, to travel around the country. Well, you really have the finances to go you, get that material. I'll tell you that. Yeah, you want to know who paid for that? Who that? As a who, patriotic who pa- gesture, the publisher, of the union leader. Because he, well, he did I, I, not like this dumping yeah. on the United States Marine that's Corps. He did not like these unfair and malicious that's tactics. I don't like How much either. did he uh, I'm out. not a Marine. How much money was laid out? Well, just a moment. I can tell you what was laid out on me. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I'm talking about Mr. Lowe. Yeah. My, my newspaper uh, wouldn't pick up uh, my my tab to go down there, although they were gracious mm-hmm. enough to give me uh, time we, off. Mm-hmm. We just but didn't know a, that before, uh, that's all. A, uh, a very uh, public-spirited gentleman in New Hampshire, a former governor... Uh, who feels uh, about this book uh, as I do uh, was kind enough to donate thirty-five dollars to me. That was my. That was the extent of it. And how much did Mr. And Loeb? We used what? Mr. Finnegan's car, incidentally. <coughs> yeah, Mr. Loeb paid the full uh, full bill down and back. It must have run six hundred or seven hundred dollars, I would say, in total. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, well, my own contribution to this really was only in terms of time. I took a week of my vacation mm-hmm. to research this. Book. Okay. Well, okay. Just, well, just let it be like on the record. To add, that's all. Jerry, to put on the record that as far as Paul and myself are concerned, every nickel that was spent on expenses for this book came out of our pockets personally. Let's take some more calls. See, the, the problem is you, we can't get to the calls, and I feel, calls. I feel poorly about that because what, what Mr. Finnegan wants to do is get off, you know, on things that... Obviously, we just don't have time to get to because we'd be here all night long. Like yeah? replying to Mr. Jeffers. Sure, I do. Did, did you reply to him? We're all done. Let's get on with the did calls. Did you reply to him? Let's get on with the calls. Yes. Did you reply to him? Indeed, I did. Let's continue. Okay. Yes or no, Jim? Did you reply to him? Indeed, How I did. Like those Let's tactics? continue. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, well, I have. Uh, this is the first I heard of the book. I caught it when I was coming home. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree that there's a lot that should be done about the Marine Corps, but I think some of the brutality in the Marine Corps is necessary to make Marines and not babies. What kind of brutality is necessary? Well, I really couldn't say. I don't, I'm not that type. I'm not a drill instructor because mm-hmm. I would have stayed in the Marine Corps if I figured I could have made a good one. But I, my nerves just wasn't for that. But I think the Marine Corps made a better person, a better man out of me because I did drop out of high school. I went to Marine Corps and I learned how not to be a quitter. That was the thing that they taught us the most. Mm-hmm. Um, we did get beat, and I didn't like it. I still, I still don't like it. If I had a son, I wouldn't want him to be beat either. If he made a mistake about something he knows nothing about, but I, I wanted to go in, and so once I was in, it was nothing I could do but take it. But I still don't think that the title of that book is right. See Paris and whatever it was, die. I just don't agree with it at all. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate your views. Maybe you ought to read the book, find out, and write them a letter if you disagree, and tell them where. Thank you very much. Next call, please. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'd like to address my uh, thoughts to uh, Mr. Finnegan, my friend. He's here. Yes, I uh, understand you spent three days in the Paris Island. Yes, we did, sir. I, uh, I spent weeks there myself as a recruit. Right. And I guess I'm still skeptical about the brutality there. I have plenty of memories uh, of the brutality there. I just thought uh, if the boot camp was run under the uh, laws that they've established, it wouldn't be necessary to have the camp on such a dangerous and uh, prison-like island. Yes, could I respond to that, sir? Uh, I understand, as I'm sure you do, that they are trying deliberately to create a high-stress situation to prepare men for combat. Uh, This is not, understandably, you know, life as usual. And when we use that term, brutal, I I think sometimes it can be used uh, carelessly. Now, now brutal means cruel, savage, unfeeling, rude, or coarse. 
Now, in some of those definitions, if you want to say a drill instructor is coarse, or that he's rude to a recruit, or that he's at times seems to be unfeeling because he's play acting, he's play acting a role in this. All right, I understand that, and it does go on, but there, there are other definitions. If you talk about cruel and savage in, in the sense of physically abusing someone, we do not countenance that for a minute. Neither, neither, neither of us, are, nor, does, uh, nor does the other gentleman here, uh, and I'm sure no one in this room would really countenance brutality. And if the book were confined, as I, I, I tried to say that. before... I challenge that statement. I well, think there you are can people challenge who do it. countenance brutality. There's plenty of them in America, I plenty of them in the United here. States. I said people here in this but There room. are people who do, and some of them are in the Army. Right. Right. Some right. of them are in the Marines, and some of them are in the Navy, and some of them are in civilian life. Right, but I think there's a far worse brutality here, and that brutality was directed against the truth. And it was done by the authors with your assistance, Mr. Williams. A sn another snide remark by Mr. Finnegan, who has... Who has who has evidently a monopoly on truth, and nobody but Mr. Finnegan has the truth but himself. Well, we could demonstrate it if we got into specific cases, but go on. Well, how many more hours would you like, Mr. Finnegan? Just uh, tell me, if you will. How many more hours shall we do? We'll stay with it as long as you can, my well, friend. Well, we can't. I mean, right. one o'clock is the end of the program, Fine. Jim. That's it. Fine. Well, people are going to sleep on us as it is with, with us bickering back and forth about whether or not uh, we can stay for the next <laughs> the seven or eight hours. Let's stop the bickering in deference to your callers and well, allow them to call Well, you quit the in. snide remarks about me. That's right. And, and when you stop that, then I won't bicker back. Mr. Williams, you can't take it, can you, when somebody's sitting here? You like to abuse people who call in when you have access to that cutoff. I never button. abuse them personally. You Not can't like take you, it. Mr. Finnegan. You can't take you it. You abuse people personally. My description of you, I think, was exceedingly accurate, Mr. Mm. Williams. You are the gutless wonder of the airwaves wow. in Boston. You really, by their words, shall ye know them. You're all upset about I've this, seen, aren't you? Yeah, I've seen vicious people. You're all upset, but aren't you, But you are Mr. the Williams. most vicious in my 26-year history in radio. I have never in my lifetime accosted anybody as vicious as you are. Hello, America. These yahoos are really in here mm -hmm. tonight. You really listen, don't you, Jim? Boy, I, I bet you your stomach really cringes when you hear me, huh? Almost Not as, at all. I saw Almost as bad as when people read your editorials about commie musky and the commie from the state of Maine, the lady from the, the senator from the state of Maine. See, here again, the same kind of tactic you've always used. I never called the state, uh, anybody from the state of Maine, see? Who did? I never said that. Nobody called him a commie. Nobody like called it? Moscow Musky? No, see, even there you can't get it I right. Mean, is it Moscow Musky that he was referred to? <laughs> Absolutely not. What was the reference? The reference was by Mr. Loeb, and it, it was long before I came to the mm -hmm. newspaper. When did you come I to the newspaper? I can't give it to uh, 1957, sir. You mean, I, I just, just recently there was a reference to well, Moscow Musky. I'll tell Musky. you why you read it, because this business is brought up and again and again and again, and usually why presented out of context. Why would people bring those things up? Well, because Mr. Loeb is a very colorful individual. I understand. And he runs stuff. a very colorful newspaper. But why would people a good bring them up if they weren't excited a about good the newspaper, fact that and people, that's why he won't have anything to do with the United American States. Society of Newspaper Publishers. He wants a little bigger. That, that really came out of the blue, didn't yeah. it? I'm, oh, I think Mr. Jeffers did I'm trying to make a reference to a United States senator who's run, running for president of the United States being referred to as Moscow Muskie. Well, he never was. Now, fish again. He never was referred to in an editorial by yourself? Nor by anybody that I know at the Union Leader. I've never heard the expression Moscow Muskie. And the Muskie. lady from Maine? Ah, now he's getting close to it. No, I'm asking you. See. Mr. Loeb, on one occasion, before I came to the paper, mm -hmm. used a reference like that, and it was Moscow Maggie, I think, and it was not used in the context well, of saying she was a communist. Would you say that the UPI reports uh, <coughs> that the Manchester Union leader referred to Mr. Muskie as Moscow Muskie were erroneous? Absolutely erroneous. All right, then you better talk to UPI. No, I'm they talking to you right now. You well, accepted it at face value. You, uh, well, can't, well, you want us to go research everything that UPI sends over the wire I'm telling as well? you, it's not so. You came to the source, my friend. Do you friend. have a UPI reference in your office? Of course we do. Is UPI in your office? Absolutely. Do you research everything UPI sends over? When we have any reason to doubt it. We certainly have no reason to doubt that the union leader would say Moscow Muskie, would we? Oh, sure we would. Sure we would. And I'm just telling you, it never did. Never happened. Never happened. Mm -hmm. if, if I research and find out that it did happen... Well, then we would have to come back and say that it did happen, mm -hmm. right? But I'm telling you now, it didn't. Okay. All right, we'll research that. Right. I saw it on UPI. It was read on practically every newscast around New England. I heard that. Well, I don't care where you heard it, my friend. I'm just telling you it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. All right, you say see, it didn't happen, is, I say it did. See, like in the case of the book, this is the importance of going to the source. Right. And you that's what really we would have wanted source, to do this you? evening. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. We wanted to get in some of these cases in greater depth, see. Well, what would you like us to do, Jim, in order to... I to, said we wanted, Mr. Williams, that's past tense. No, Mr. what would you like to... Why don't you allow your listeners to call in? Well, they, that's what you don't want. That's oh, what do you want don't that. want. Every do time want that. you make a snide remark, I told you I was going to make reference to it. That was at 10.05.
That's what I said at that time, and every time you make one, I'm going to refer to it. You're the one who made the snide remark about the union leader and, and Mr. Loeb's editorials, my friend. And you're not debating Mr. Loeb. You're debating me. I didn't say you tell about me about what I've written. Who have I called a name? Me. When? What did I call you? Your snide remarks are references to my character all the time. Three what or four I... minutes ago, you called him the gutless wonder of the airways. Exactly. Yeah. I'll go along with that right. one. You yeah. want me to get, dig out your own editorials for you? Sure, go right ahead. See. I only received one response to it uh, when, when you wrote it. Oh, come on. Now means, yeah, I got yeah. one letter on it, yeah. Jim. One letter. You know full well you'll hear about You'll hear about this program because people listen to this program. Yeah. They listen to to, uh, to issues being debated or being discussed, as the case may be. It's too bad but because we got of your one harassing we tactics got one this evening. We couldn't get into these cases, is it? You're the, you're the one who does the harassing. No, we couldn't get into these cases. People can judge this for themselves. I, I referred to that Bartolomeo case, which was in the book. Yeah. Yeah, did I not? Yes. Did we get into it? Did you? You changed the subject. You, you want to get into talking about did you? Bartolomeo? You, you want to get switched? into it now? I thought you switched was, to conception. the Concepcion case was the one. Oh, we did finish with that, didn't yeah, we? Did we? Oh, yes, it was like pulling teeth. Drag the authors yeah. and the, yourself. The callers screaming don't into it. the arena of debate till we get out. Well, what are we going to do now? Sit well, here, we're going to wind it up because... I, uh, obviously, Duffy, why, why don't you let Mr. McDuffie One One thing that I would like to see happen now, as we mentioned earlier in the program, is is to really, and it may even restore my faith in in one aspect of... Uh, in the uh, one aspect of American journalism, I'd like to see the Manchester Union leader publish a verbatim transcript of never, this debate. Never, never. I know. Oh, well, you know the well. button. I know. You know the button happened. that George if it Wallace requires wears, a letter. Never. I'll write it. I would like to see well, WINS I, uh, put on a program featuring myself and allowing me to document the 46 exceptions in the book, uh, the 18 misrepresentations. First of all, of WINS didn't pay any of our expenses. Well, you're talking about but the a Manchester form of information, Union leader. Like paid all your expenses so what? to have you try to dig up dirt that you did not find. No, no, dirt. We didn't dig up any dirt this evening. Documentation. All the dirt was dug up by you, and we haven't been allowed and to present you, the documentation you went to because the you can't answer. In the Pentagon. We went to no flackies in any found, Pentagon. We never went to the found, Pentagon. Another misstatement. You fact. go to a, a doctor, a psychologist, who is still in the service, you misrepresent and you again. ask him for his personal opinion which you know full well he's not going to give you regarding autopsies and regarding uh, psychological training, uh, uh, psychological I might training point in the out background that the Are you testing. talking about? You have it all wrong. He did give us his opinion all about this. Oh, but Mr. As long just as, read it to you. As long as it was, as long as it was the opinion that was beneficial to the court. Uh, I, I have it to just interrupt so because to be his uh, opinion. time is pressing upon us, and Mr. Uh, Finnegan doesn't think that five hours is sufficient time. I don't know. I've never done a program five hours long. This is the first time in my, my long uh, history in radio that we've ever extended a program. Yeah. I've done programs on the Kennedy assassination, which have a lot more detail and a lot more anger and a lot more emotion involved than the U.S. Marine Corps. But I've never, never had to extend a program to give extra time to make sure that we were doing the best we could in terms of, of allowing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the whole story to be here. But that's not enough for Mr. Finnegan. That's still not enough for you, is it, Jim? Well, let me make it very clear, my friend. As long as you continue these harassing statements, as long as you continue these harassments, we could probably go on for five days and never got into the Melson case well, or, the, uh, or the, any of the other cases because you really don't want to. That's right. Obviously, ladies and gentlemen, by the program itself, the five hours involved, Mr. Finnegan doesn't feel that he has been given enough time to document his case. Uh, to state Oh, I think we have <laughs> fully documented it. Well, then what, what do we need more for? Maybe overkill. We want to document all of these uh, But that's impossible, Mr. Finnegan. Well, we you can't even try a, one. You can could, we try one? You could do... I can't do it. Oh, we can't do no, it. No, I We've can't. We've run out of time again. That's right. Oh, my gosh. We've run out of time all evening. Did you have space in the Manchester Union later? You know, in the time we're talking about this, I can document one right now Manchester and allow the gentleman to reply. You have space in the Manchester Union Indeed, later? we do. Why don't you print the transcript and let people make up their own minds? You invited us here for a debate. I think that anybody listening to this broadcast it's is obvious. aware that we were divided, invited here to debate that there are certain cases. The book is entitled See Paris and Die. These authors have not proved their case. They, they have tried to prove it through <coughs> misrepresentation, and we have not been allowed to get into any other case except the Concepcion case, and we could have gone further into that, as well, you know, all right. because they do not want to be proven wrong, and quite obviously right, you don't Mr. want to continue it you have a final statement to make? Well, very briefly, just one minute, if you will. I have to be off by one o'clock. Oh, uh, very briefly, I would uh, say only that it is very regrettable that uh, Mr. Jeffers, with his vast knowledge of journalism, didn't apply didn't apply it to the authorship of this book. Uh, I regret also that we haven't had the opportunity 
uh, for one reason or another, uh, to get into the full documentation of the facts that we have the, to refute uh, the allegations, many of the allegations made in the book. Uh, I will repeat uh, the accusation of innuendos, uh, misrepresentations, and I would be delighted to come back at any time to go into them specifically in more detail. I thank you, Mr. Williams, for the opportunity to have been here. Bill Cusack? Yeah, briefly, I think the Marines are, are truly a very good outfit. And I think the talk of brutality is necessary because I'm confident that there are certain cases of brutality. But the danger that I fear is that outside pressures uh, to reform the Marine Corps could lead to a softening up. I think uh, the Marines uh, have proven themselves time and time again, and I think in this particular case, what has to be done would be done by the Marines and done best by the Marines. Dick Levitan? In answer to the charges that have been made against uh, my personal character, my professional integrity, and the result of the book that we wrote, See Paris and Die, Brutality in the U.S. Marines, I think Mr. Finnegan uh, and Mr. McDuffie have failed totally in to refute a single charge or accusation that we have made. To re they have failed totally to refute a single statement of fact which we have given in the book as fact and that they have become, as others have, total lackeys uh, of the public relations efforts of the Marine Corps higher command, so to speak, uh, as is evident by even the supply of photographs to them, uh, which, Mr. by the way, Mr. Uh, Finnegan admitted to me later on when we were off the air that when he was talking to me about the door, that the furniture indeed was changed around from the, the time burned. I was there. The door and burned. so indeed that, that's Paul my Jeffers? point. Well, Mr. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Mr. Finnegan began uh, talking about uh, truth as a, as a victim. Uh, I don't think uh, truth is a victim in our book. I think truth, as, as Mr. Finnegan sees it, is, is simply distorted from having worked for as long as he has for a newspaper that simply never prints the truth. Mr. Finnegan? You know there's a sign, have we noticed this, over the drill instructor school down at Paris Island, and that sign reads, the future of the United States Marine Corps begins here. You know, observing that sign and reflecting on its meanings, I couldn't help but think the future of the United States of America begins here. For the Marine Corps is an elite unit of America's armed forces, and the elite of that elite is the Marine Corps drill instructor, the prime target of the authors of this distortion-filled book we have discussed this evening. Thank you very much. Um, I really don't think I should say anymore, but I, I have never been involved with a man like Mr. Finnegan before. And I must admit that all my debates, all my discussions, I've never been involved with anyone the likes of Mr. Finnegan. I always wanted to see who was behind the people who write the editorials in newspapers because they rarely surface. The people who write editorials for the Globe or the Herald or other newspapers rarely want to come out in the open, rarely want to talk. They're usually aren't, aren't very good talkers. We do it all the uh, time. But I'm indicating to you that I, I really never realized I undersold you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Finian. I thought that perhaps the editorials were just that way because it was the style of the Manchester Union leader over the years, but I didn't realize it truly is your own style as well. You're afraid of a little vigor, aren't no, you? No, no, I'm friend? just, I'm sure just uh, telling you the truth. If you want the you truth... You run from the truth all night. Right. Don't okay. make me laugh. Uh, I'm not trying to make you laugh at all. That's why you wouldn't get into any of these other cases. <laughs> I think everybody listening... Five hours knows. later, ladies and gentlemen, he's still talking about getting into it. Five and days later, I would be, if you can control this thing. Well, I, have I controlled it? Oh, yes. All right. Harassing well, tactics, we'll, we never got into those We'll cases. see this, of course, all in the Manchester Union leader and Mr. And Mr. Finnegan's own inimitable style. I'm not a reporter, by the way. No, but I'm I'm a, we'll see writer. it there anyway. We'll see it in the editorials. You said in my style. Indicate your personal view as well as the newspaper's point no, of view. No, it won't. Never does. Uh, and uh, it never does, huh? No. You mean to say Absolutely those editorials not. about WBZ and myself? Uh, they were editorials. Yeah. Clearly labeled as such, my yeah. friend. But they yes. were your personal view as well. Exactly, and I don't retract a single one, not Good. a comma or a sentence. Good, I don't expect you to. I never thought you would. Yes, well, just why should I? You've you demonstrated, demonstrated it this evening, the face my friend. of those editorials You've de demonstrated is obviously your own face as well. Well, I'm a nasty fellow, just like you. That is for sure. Thank you very much, and good night, good luck, good morning, good night to you. Hi, this is Larry Glick, and I'll be seeing you right after the news on Radio 103. The Spirit of New England, WBZ, Boston, Group W, Westinghouse Broadcasting. It's 26 degrees in Boston. I'm Harry Savas, reporting the 1 o'clock WBZ News. 
Officials at the Norfolk State Prison are investigating the stabbing death of an inmate serving a life sentence for murder. The prison doctor said the inmate, 36-year-old Theodore Maver of Peabody, died of a puncture wound of the chest tonight. Maver was rushed to the hospital after being carried from the prison dining area by four other inmates. Norfolk Prison Superintendent Theodore Rostano says some 40 inmates in Maver's cell block are now being questioned. In a major address before the Washington Press Club, Senator Edward Kennedy accused the Nixon administration of turning its back on America's 25 million blacks. The senator from Massachusetts says it would be a wiser man than he who could predict the direction the country will take if the president fails to act in the civil rights area. In what was described by some as Senator Kennedy's own State of the Union address, he also blasted the president's Vietnam policy, and he also criticized the administration's economic policies for providing excuses instead of a program that's effective. In a campaign swing through New Hampshire last night, Senator George McGovern says the United States should do what it did after World War II and provide aid to North Vietnam when the war ends in Indochina. McGovern cited this country's massive post-war economic programs to help get Japan and Germany back on their feet. The Surgeon General's Scientific Advisory Committee on Television and Social Behavior says violence on TV contributes only in a small way to violence in America. In a carefully worded report made public yesterday, the group says there was no overwhelming evidence that TV violence will promote aggressive action among children. The dean of the Boston University School of Communication, Gerhard Wiebe, helped write the report and admits that it is less than conclusive and leaves many unanswered questions. Some studies...